Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Authors at Google event um, with novelist Richard Price. Richard's work has appeared in various publications, including the New York Times, Esquire, and the New Yorker, and he's the author of eight novels, including The Wanderers and Clockers, which was made into a movie whose screenplay Richard co-wrote with Spike Lee. Um, his other screenplays include Shaft, Ransom, and The Color of Money. In addition, he wrote for the HBO series The Wire, and he's here today to speak with us about his new novel, Lush Life, which was recently published to much acclaim, and which hopefully some of you are holding in your hands now. Um, about the book, novelist Russell Banks said, with Lush Life, Richard Price has become a postmodern American Balzac, except that he's a whole lot funnier than Balzac and writes the language we hear and speak, better than any novelist around, living or dead, American or French. He's a writer I hope my great-grandchildren will read, so they'll know what it was like to be truly alive in the early 21st century. Richard will be speaking about his book and then taking questions from you, the audience. If you do have a question for him during the Q&A session, um, please make your way over to the microphone on the left side of the room as we are recording this event for YouTube. Um, after the event, Richard will be signing books for anyone who is interested and would like to stick around. So with that, please join me in welcoming Richard Price to Google. Um, is it okay if I stand here? Is that double mic? Or it's okay? Um, I, I'm probably the most low-tech person on this campus. I feel like Encino Man or something. Um, what I'd like to do is just read about 10 minutes uh, just to give you a taste of the book and uh, the, world it, the world it takes place in. It's about the Lower East Side of New York, who, which I'm sure some of you know and some of you don't, and it's too long to explain. But let, suffice it to say, it's an area that historically uh, is where all the Eastern European immigrants got off the boat, they went right into the Lower East Side. Uh, in 1900, it had the highest population density in the world, including Calcutta. Uh, and it morphed all through the years until it became the most dangerous area in New York City. It was like basically an open air heroin market in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And then, so then real estate came in, and Giuliani, America's mayor, you can have him, became, uh, imposed Giuliani time. Uh, which is if you so much as light up a menthol cigarette, you get locked up. And so it went from the most dangerous place to the safest place. In fact, one reviewer of the book said, it's a neighborhood in which the cops became park rangers. Uh, however, if, if, if you're a, pr a precinct commander of a very safe neighborhood, you still have to make your, you have to bring in your numbers to one police plaza. And if you haven't arrested anybody, because you've done a good job or something, there's, no, there's nobody to arrest. One police plaza will just see like, hey, there's no arrest. What are you guys doing? So you get hoisted on the petard of your own success. And so what they do is they, they've created something called the Quality of Life Squad. And what the Quality of Life Squad is, is four plainclothes cops in a fake taxi that sits on the Williamsburg Bridge and profiles all the cars coming over from Brooklyn into Lower Manhattan. And it's racial profiling, basically. If they see a couple of guys look like they might have something on them, you know, they'll just follow them until something bad happens. Like, you'll find out. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to read is just like a typical car stop done by the Quality of Life Squad. The four names that you'll hear are Scharf, Daly, Gehagen, and Lugo. Those are the four cops. And the two kids uh, that they stopped, their names are seriously and screwed. Um, all right, so you got 900 pounds of white meat, you know, just prowling the Lower East Side looking for likelies. Hang on. Sharp abruptly perks up, his head on a swivel. That there looks good. High beams going west, four bodies going west. Lugo, it's kind of dim over here. Lugo, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to start all over again. Hang on. Sharf abruptly perks up, his head on a swivel. That there looks good. High beams going west. Four bodies. Going west, Lugo floors it in heavy traffic. Think thin, girls, as he takes the driver's side wheels up the concrete divider to get past a real cab waiting for the light, then whips into a U-turn to get abreast of the target car, peering in. 
uh, females, two mommies, two kids, passing them, hungrier now, all of them, then Sharif ahoying once again, green Honda going east. Now east, he says. Lugo does another 180 and pulls behind the Honda. All right, what do we got? Two males in the front. What do we got? Neon trim on the plate. Tinted windows. Right rear taillight. Up oh, front passenger just stuffed something under the seat. Thank you. Lugo hits the misery lights, climbs up the Honda's back, the driver taking a half a block to pull over. Daly and Lugo slowly walk up on either side of the car, cross beam the front seats. The driver, a young green-eyed Latino, <clears throat> rolls down his window. Officer, what'd I do? Lugo rests his cross arms on the open window as if it's a backyard fence. License and registration, please. For real, what'd I do? You always drive like that? His voice almost gentle. Like what? Signal and lane changes, all road courteous and shit. Excuse me? Come on, nobody does that unless they're nervous about something. Well, I was. Nervous? You was following me. A cab was following you? Yeah, okay, a cab. Passing over his papers. All serious, officer. No disrespect intended. Maybe I can learn something here. But what did I do? Primary, you have neon trim on your plates. Hey, I didn't put it there. That's my sister's whip. Secondary, your windows are too dark. I told her about that. Tertiary, you crossed a solid yellow to get around a double parked car. Quadrary, you're sitting by a hydrant. That's cause you just pulled me over. <laughs> Lugo takes a moment to assess the level of mouth he's getting. As a rule, he is soft spoken, leaning into the driver's window to conversate, to explain, his expression baggy with patience, going eye to eye as if to make sure what he's explicating here is being digested, seemingly deaf to the obligatory sputtering, the misdemeanors of verbal abuse, but, if the driver says that one thing, goes one word over some invisible line, then without any change of expression, without any warning signs except maybe a slow straightening up, a sad, disgusted looking off, he steps back, reaches for the door handle, and the world as they knew it is no more. But this kid wasn't too bad. This is for your own benefit. Get out of the car, please. As Lugo escorts the driver to the rear bumpers, Daly leans into the shotgun seat window and tilts his chin at the passenger, the second kid sitting there affecting comatosity, heavy lidded under a too big baseball cap and staring straight ahead as if they were still driving somewhere. So what's your story, Daly says, opening the passenger door, offering this one some sidewalk too. As Gehagen, all tatted out in Celtic braids, knots, and crosses, leans in to search the glove compartment, the cup caddy, the tape storage bin, Sharf taking the rear seats. Back at the bumpers, the driver stands in a scarecrow tee, looking off so loud. As Lugo, squinting through his own cigarette smoke, finger walks his pockets, coming up with a fat roll of 20s. It's a lot of cheddar, cuz. Counting it, then stuffing it in the kid's shirt pocket before continuing the pat down. Yeah, well, that's my college tuition money. What the fuck college takes cash, Lugo laughs. Then finished, gestures to the bumper. Have a seat. Burke Technical in the Bronx, it's new. And they take cash? Money's money. True that, Lugo shrugs, just waiting out the car search. So what's your major? Furniture management? You ever been locked up before? Come on, man, my uncle's like a detective in the Bronx. Like a detective? No, a detective, he just retired. Oh yeah, what precinct? I don't know per se, the 69th? The fight in 69th, Gehagen calls out, feeling under the passenger seat now. There is no 69th, Lugo says, flicking his button to the gutter. 60-something, I said I wasn't sure. What's his name? Rodriguez? Oh, Rodriguez in the Bronx? That narrows it down. <laughs> what's, what's his first name? Narciso? Don't know him. Had a big retirement party? Sorry. Well, I've been thinking of trying out for the police academy myself. Oh, yeah, that's great. Hey, Donnie. Gehagen backs out of the passenger door, holds up a Ziploc of weed. Because we need more, we need more fucking smoke hounds. The kid closes his eyes, tilts his chin to the stars, to the moon over Delancey. His or yours? Lugo gestures to the other kid on the sidewalk, face still blank as a mask, his pockets strewn over the car hood. Somebody needs to say or you both go. Mine, the driver finally mutters. Turn around, please. Ah, oh, you gonna lock me up for that? <clears throat> hey, two seconds ago you stepped up like a man. Stay with that. 
Lugo cuffs him, then turns him forward again, holding him at arm's length as if to assess his outfit for the evening. Anything else in there? Tell us now, we'll rip that hoopty to shreds. Damn, man, I barely had that. All right, then just relax, guiding him back down to the bumper as the search continues nonetheless. The kid looks off, shakes his head, mutters, sorry ass. Excuse me? No, I'm just saying. Purse in his mouth, not about you. Gehagen comes back with the baggie, hands it over. Okay, look. Lugo lights another cigarette, takes a long first drag. This? We could give a damn. We're out here on a higher calling. He nods at a passing patrol car, something the driver said, making him laugh. You know what I'm saying? More serious shit? There you go. That's all I got. I'm not talking about what you got. I'm talking about what you know. What I know? You know what I'm saying. They both turn and look off in the direction of the East River, two guys having a moment, one with his hands behind his back. Finally, the kid exhales heavily. Well, I can tell you where a weed spot is. You're kidding me, right? Lugo rears, rears back. I'll tell you where a weed spot is. I'll tell you where 50 is. I can get you better shit than this for half what you paid seven days a week with blindfolds on. The kid sighs, tries not to look at the barely curious locals coming out of the Banco de Ponce ATM Center and the Dunkin' Donuts, the college kids hopping in and out of taxis. Come on, do right by me, I'll do right by you. Lugo absently tosses the baggie from hand to hand, drops it, picks it up. Do right like how? I want a gun. A what? I don't know a gun. You don't have to know a gun, but you know someone who knows someone, right? Oh man, for starters, you know who you bought this shit from, right? I don't know any gun, man. You got $40 a weed there. I paid for it with my own money because it helps me relax, helps me party. Everybody knows, like, go to work, go to school, get high, that's it. Huh, so like there's no one you could call say, yo, I just got jacked in the PJs, I need me a one-time whistle, can I meet you at such and such? A whistle? Lugo makes a finger gun. Oh, you mean a hammer? A hammer, a whistle. Lugo turns away and tightens his ponytail. Pfft. the kid looks off then. I know a knife. Lugo laughs, my mother knows a knife. This one's used. Forget it. Then chin, chin, chin tilting to the other kid. What about your sidekick there? My cousin? He's like half retarded. <laughs> How about the other half? Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. The driver lolls his head like a cow. Another patrol car rolls up, this one to pick up the prisoner. All right, just think about it, okay? Lugo says, I'll see you back in holding in a few hours. What about my car? Gilbert Grape there, he's got a license? His brother does. Well then tell him to call his brother and get his ass down here before you wind up towed. Damn, then calling out, Raymond, you hear that? The cousin nods but makes no move to retrieve his cell phone from the car hood. So you never answered my question, Lugo says, skull steering him into the, rest of the, into the rear of the cruiser. You ever been locked up before? The kid turns his head away, murmurs something. It's okay, you can tell me. I said, yes. Four, the kid shrugs, embarrassed, says, this? Yeah, around here? Uh-huh. How long back? On Christmas Eve? On Christmas Eve for this? Lugo winces, that is cold. Who the fuck, do you remember who collared you? Uh-huh. The kid mutters, then looks Lugo in the face, you. <laughs> Thank you. So. <clears throat> Um, the, book, the book is centers around a murder. Uh, um, <clears throat> the Lower East Side right now is such a, a mi mishmash of different cultures. Um, you got the Fujianese Chinese that live there in huge numbers and nobody really knows them because they don't want to be known. Um, you have the Orthodox Jews, you have the housing project culture, there are about six housing projects. You have the tenements that haven't been touched by real estate lava yet, and they're unrehabbed. And in those, you have Chinese, Hispanic, uh, old geezer crackpot hippie. Um, and on top of everything else, you have this massive influx of, influx of young people, you know, fresh out of college, that the Lower East Side has become their Montparnasse. You know, this is where you go to play. Uh, and the rents went straight up through the roof. And the thing is, in this giant world, these pe none of these people see each other. The Chinese don't see the Jews. The Jews don't see the young kids. The young kids don't see the blacks. You know, uh, nobody, they just occupy the same physical space. But 
the, I mean, there's, there's no blatant animosity, there's no confrontations. Everybody just lives in their own world. The only time these worlds um, clash is about three, four in the morning when a couple of kids from one of the housing projects decides to go you know, to one of the Zagat streets and um, brace a couple of kids that are, that are bar hopping. Problem is, these kids from the projects, they'll whip out a gun, they'll say, give it up. The kids that they uh, just stopped are from Indiana. They're not street smart. Uh, they're drunk. And maybe one kid will do the right thing, look down, you know, whoops, look down, um, hand over his wallet, I'm not looking at you, I won't be able to ID you in a lineup, just go. That the other kid, all of a sudden, he's in a movie, and he thinks he's John Wayne, and he says something stupid, and it's, it's called suicide by beer. Um, and he says the wrong thing, and the kid with the gun, you know, he's got an audience, you know, and it's, he doesn't want to look like a punk, and he's not thinking too clearly, and, you know, bang. And for five days, you have headlines, because the uh, media's favorite victim is some kid from out of state with stars in his eyes who came to New York, the big dream, and gunned down on the cold, hard concrete, you know, by, you know, the, the local animals. And the newspapers love it. And whatever the newspapers love, the police department is crazy for it. I mean, media is the tail that wags the police dog. And um, so the book is about a homicide, like a robbery that turns into a homicide and then sort of like a manhunt, which is just my excuse to journey through this very complex uh, small world called the Lower East Side. And anyways, if anybody has any questions or anything about, it has to not have anything to do with computers. <laughs> but um, yes? I kind of know something about your background, but can you say something about your background and how you got into writing and this type of, type of writing? Yeah. Um, well, World War II, I was in the OSS, and then when it morphed into the CIA, they asked me to come along. I tried to pass for Gentile, you know. No, oh, actually. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, I grew up in the Bronx and, um, you know, working class family. My father, uh, you know, drove a cab. His father uh, was a, um, uh, worked in a factory in Brooklyn, and, but he also used to write poetry. And when I was a kid, I'd see the poetry to be published in, on, on mimeograph paper. You know, when was the last time anybody heard the word mimeograph? You know, and like stapled together. And I just remember going to my grandfather's house and looking at it, and it was this poem. I don't know what the poem meant, you know, and then I saw my grandfather's name. And I saw like my father really revered his father, you know, for being able to write like this. And I just said, I want some of that. It's just a good thing that my grandfather wasn't like a wrestler or an opera singer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I honestly wanted to be a writer, and I never gave a thought about, well, what are you going to write about? I don't know. I'm a writer. Every every kid's got to be a something. You know, some one kid's got to have the best hair or be the best dancer or the math brain, or the best athlete, or the toughest. So I said, I'm going to be known as the writer. So in, in my, but I don't, didn't really write anything. I didn't really become a writer until I was in my early 20s. And I was at Stanford uh, in the writing program. And before that, I just wrote very sort of glib, playful stuff. It was all dressed up and no place to go. But when I was at Stanford, I, I got homesick for the Bronx. Not necessarily that I wanted to go back to the Bronx, but just the realization you're never, you never are going to go back to the Bronx. It only exists in your head right now. And for the first time in my life, I had something I wanted to write about. I wanted to crystallize my memories. And um, what I did is I wrote all these stories that are kind of apocryphal stories about the kids that I knew in, in this, right before Vietnam, like that era, Beatles, pre-Beatles. You know, growing up in a housing project, all these white working class gangs, and there were Chinese gangs and black gangs. And I mean, I was a little pouring it on a little bit. And I just wrote all these stories. And basically, I wrote all these stories to make me feel like I exist. Because I was really, I was in California. It was the first time in my life I've ever been out of New York. I didn't even know enough to have a car. 
You know, and as it was, I, I lasted three months, and then I went back to New York. But it, it was that kind of like this homesickness that made me feel like I got to write. You no, know, the story finally became more important than wanting to be known as a writer. And a lot of times, I teach writing, or I, I you know, sporadically, and I always tell my, always tell the students, you know, you can't really judge how good a writer you are, or or aren't until you try to write the story that you were intended to write. You know, a lot of people write, and writing is very frustrating to them because after three pages, they peter out. It's because, you know, you, what's, what's the story? What are you burning to tell me? What do you, it's not so much what do you know that I don't, but it's like what inside you are you trying to get out? What out in the big world really makes you crazy and you want to get more engaged with it, you know, and do something with? Um, it, it's, it's a malady of, like, younger writers, but sometimes... It can plague you on and off your whole life. I go two, two three years between books because I just can't figure out, you know, uh, what to fall in love with. You know, nothing's grabbing me. And it can be very frustrating. So. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for coming to Google. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the difference between writing for the different media that you've written for. So yeah. film versus okay. novel versus television. Because um, your, your dialogue that you read, it, it seems to translate so well across those media. And I was wondering what sort of adjustments you make mentally when you're writing. All right. Well, there's a very big difference between writing a screenplay and writing a, uh, a novel. One's chess, the other one's speed chess. Uh, <laughs> when you're writing a screenplay, you're writing for a two-dimensional surface, a screen. All that's in there is stage directions and things that's supposed to come out. Guy gets in the car, guy says this, guy gets out of car, car gets hit by helicopter, World War III breaks out, Will Smith goes, oh shit, you know, cut two. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, I mean I'm, I'm being glib about it again, but it's, it's you're writing for a two-dimensional surface. So everything has got to be on the surface. People do things, people say things. You got 120 pages, you hand it in. And what's the most important thing in screenwriting is the architecture, that you built a story that moves inexorably like a pyramid. You got five characters, and within two hours, they're all going to converge at the tip of the pyramid. And that's a screenplay. And the dialogue, people think if you have a good ear, that, oh, man, you must be a great uh, movie writer. Dialogue is not essential. Even if you have bad dialogue, it's going to come out of a, an actor's mouth. It's going to sort of sound better than it deserves. Or if the actor can't say it, he's going to go to the director, can I say this instead? And the director goes, yeah, sure, you know, just to get a better performance, because it's about the actor's the one on the screen, not the writer. So you know, screenwriting is, is, is like super, it's hard, but it's superficial. The best screenwriter in the world would make an awful novelist, because it would be the thinnest novel you'd ever read. By the same token, the best novelist in the world would make the worst screenwriter because everything would be wordy and turgid and not geared towards movement, you know. And I'd say most of the novelists, the, the major American novelists I know, have a screenplay tucked in their, their drawer, and it should never come out. <laughs> and I assume that there are some screenwriters out there who have a novel in their drawer, and that should never come out. Um, when you're writing, the difference is when you're writing a novel, it's four-dimensional. People say and do things, but you also have to create the interior life of the characters. And there's this thing called writing. There's no writing in a screenplay. It's just memos to the director. You know, but it's the, it's the voice of the narrator. It's the voice that's telling the story, you know, the, you know, the, the God voice that's telling the story. So, I mean, I, if I'm doing one, I better have the right hat on. If I have a novelist hat on when I'm doing a screenplay, I'm going to wind up in the emergency room. You know, I mean, it kind of, it's kind of like squash and racquetball, you know, deceptively similar, but you're going to, you know, wind up uh, needing a physical therapist if you have the wrong racket, you know. Hi. Uh, when you're uh, in between novels, do you read other fiction or try to stay away from it? And if you do, do you read fiction that's, uh, you know, similar to yours or who are your... Favorite? Well, it, it depends. It's like... Usually what, what happens to me is when I'm in the middle of writing something, I'm completely freaked out. Like, this stinks, this sucks. It's like, all I can remember is the shiny book that was in the bookstore three years ago. And um, 
you forget that it was hell to get that book in a bookstore. And what you're writing now, your first draft, it's about as miserable as the first draft of that. All you can remember is People Magazine liked it, and it was in the window of a bookstore. So I'm freaked out. I'm totally insecure when I'm writing it. I worry this thing into existence. It takes years. It's like a nightmare, and it's boring. Um, so in that period, I've got to be careful what I read, because if I'm reading somebody who's writing something sort of in the same ballpark as mine, I'm going to get panicked that, oh my god, I forgot, oh, you know, I, I left the Taiwanese, I only did the mainland Chinese, oh god, this guy got the Taiwanese, why didn't I think, quick, get me the Taiwanese embassy, you know, and it's like the, you know, it's, I'm, I get now, because this book is out, and this is kind of like a victory lap, you know, um, I don't care, I'll read anything, you know, Shakespeare, bring it on, man, <laughs> you know, but, um, I, the worst thing that ever happened to me, I was, I was writing probably my worst book. Uh, it was called The Breaks. The book before The Breaks took me three weeks to write. It's called Ladies' Man. At the end of three, it looked like it was written in three weeks. It took another year to get in shape. But I got the whole damn thing down in three weeks. And it took, I said, great, next book's going to take three days. That one took four years and was half as good. But while I was reading The Breaks and in, in this, like, writing The Breaks and in this panic about Characters, I made the mistake of reading Sophie's Choice, you know, and it was William Styron's masterpiece, you know, and I was going, oh, shit, I forgot the Holocaust. I got to get the Holocaust in there, man. How am I going to get the Holocaust in? You know, and I just, it just, I fell apart, you know, and so I got, I'm, I'm a little protective, you know, when, when I'm like nuts around a book. When I'm not, I'll read anything. Yeah, so um, I think come up, the previous two question askers um, mentioned TV and then other people that you may have uh, read. Mm -hmm. So uh, the creators of The Wire, you know, well known. And I noticed watching the series, they had a lot of heavy hitter um, people listed, such as yourself, George Pelicanos. I mean, did you guys work? Collaboratively, or did they well, bring that, in that was, that was a unique experience working on The Wire, which thanks to DVD season series, people are actually watching now. Um, I don't know any show that benefited from the season-long DVD. Because you, you couldn't watch that show an hour at a time. It was just too complex. And was, you know, I always say stuff happened in season one, episode six. It didn't pay off until season three, episode four. You know? And you know, people are channel surfing, oh, The Wire. You know, it's like, you're a dead man. You know, you got, you, got, you got to sit down, but um, the way it worked is at the beginning of the season, the two creators, David Simon and, and Ed Burns, and would sit down with whoever on the staff would like to come to this meeting, and they say, who are we going to attack this year? What institution? Because the theme of the show is why cities don't work, how cities don't work. And, you, and every year had its own institution. The year, I mean, year three was about the war on drugs. You know, uh, year four was about the public school system. This last year was about the media, you know, and the budget cutbacks and, uh, you know, the out-of-town ownership of newspapers and everything. Um, so you, you go to that first meeting, you go to a couple of days to some hotel with, you know, everybody else is there to play golf and fool around on their wife. And you're sitting there with like these, you know, three jalubs, you know, and uh, what's going to happen to Omar? Oh, we're going to kill Omar? Nah, we'll kill him next year. You know, and we figure, our school, okay, now we got to create four kids. You know, all right, we got this kid. What's this kid's name? Let's call him Dookie. And I don't like Dookie. It's slang word for crap, you know. No, 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 it'll be good. Like Duke Snyder. Okay, all right, whatever. You know, so you go through that for about three days, and then you go off. And then you're assigned episodes. So if you have episode three and episode nine, as one and two come in, you're, you come back for a story meeting on your episode. And you're up on what happened in one and two, and you know the characters pretty well. And then you work it out on, on, a, on a cork board. Um, OK, what, what's happening to Omar this episode? What's happening at City Hall? What's happening on the drug corners? What's happening uh, with the corrupt congressman? Uh, what's happening with the, uh, with the police? And you bang out four or five scene beats that, OK, three things happen to Omar. Four things happen at City Hall. And they're all color coded by you know, whose trajectory it is. And then you have to, at the end of two days, you finally, OK, and then you figure out what the sequence you want. So you take a blue and a yellow and an orange. And the writer, moi, 
goes home with a stack of index cards, multicolored index cards in order with a rubber band. And my job basically is to flesh out the index cards. It's kind of like writing in a phone booth. I mean, I don't have a lot of freedom. But my thing has to perfectly follow from one and two and has to perfectly set up the guy who's writing four simultaneously with me writing three. So I can't decide Omar is really straight in episode three, and I can't kill anybody, and I can't have anybody become a priest you know, if, if, because of a personal crisis. I mean, everybody knows in advance what I'm writing. The only freedom I have is in, OK, the scene's got to start here, and the result of the scene's got to be this. It's up to me how I get from here to here. And that's a very little wiggle room. It gets worse because I'm writing episodes nine, but seven and eight ran long. So they bumped stuff from seven into eight and then eight into nine. So I got Dennis Lehane's stuff in my thing. But they're pushing my stuff out into George Pelicanus' um, episode 10. So even though my name is on it, you're listening to Dennis Lehane's dialogue. But it, it's, it's just too complex. The moral of the story of which is check your ego at the door. And you do it not for the money, because when you open up that envelope, like this moth keeps f you know, <laughs> fluttering out. And, you know, like, and like, you know, like a sewing kit you know, from, stolen from a hotel. Um, but you do it because it was the wire. And it's like, uh, you know, you know uh, it's a big deal. It was very cool. And you want to be part of it. You know? Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to Google. Um, uh, you have a very distinct voice, and it sounds like you have had uh, not trouble, but it's been a challenge to you know um, keep influences in a way that's productive for you. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what influences you, or what you um, what you look to to influence your writing. When you said you have challenges, what do you, what do you oh, mean? I just I, I just meant that you had talked about you know reading Sophie's Choice and you know and trying to keep a mindset when you when you go to work on a new project. I I guess I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. sort of. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's no such thing as free money. You know, it's like everything, everything worth doing is hard. You know, and, so, and there's no guarantee it's going to succeed. I mean, you, you, it's like a throw of the dice every time you go out there. The, the one thing that I found that's helpful to me is that if I finish a book, like I can't even imagine what I'm going to write next. But the way I'm going to get there is I learned by doing screenplays that you don't have to write, everything does not have to be autobiographical. You don't have to experience personally what you're writing about. That doesn't, I'm not referring to like, so you can write historical novels. I'm saying it's a big world out there. You know? And I learned writing screenplays where they, I was a hired pen. They said, you go learn about pool hustlers. You go learn about police. I didn't know anything about these people. But I found out I could learn about these people, come home, and if you had enough empathy and enough imagination, you could write successfully about something that you didn't personally experience. So what I learn right now is to just like there's a whole world out there, and I don't have to sit there staring at my navel, you know, till till the chandelier falls on my head, you know. Um, where do I? What do I? What what intrigues me in the newspaper? Where do I want to go? Maybe if I physically put myself in a place, it's going to trigger something in me. That's the only thing I can do to provoke a novel out of me. You know, believe me, it doesn't come from sitting at that desk with your hands in knots going, come on, baby. You know, it just does not work that way. You know, um, and you know, they say, oh, you have all this time yourself. But, you know, beware what you wish for. Sometimes there's nothing scarier than a blank desk. You know, and I just w went in a jam. I just go out and I get lost somewhere. And, I, you know, sometimes you find yourself when you get lost. That's it, you know. So that's usually what I do. But I don't know if that answers your question completely, though. Yeah, um, I actually had another question. I hope that the, it, it's not too obscure. Um, I'd heard about an article uh, with David Shore where he'd recounted a, an episode. I guess you had taken a tour of uh, Baltimore, and you'd heard the term apple scrapple. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you had managed to use that in a, in a novel. Not yet. Not yet. I, <laughs> Sounds like maybe I'll use it in a song or something. It sounds like the Lennon sisters or something. Yeah. No, I remember David Simon, the creator of The Wire, took me around to, to meet all the guys that he wrote. He wrote this series called The Corner. And it was like a year in the life of a drug corner. And he wanted to introduce me to the real life counterparts of the characters. And he, he introduced me to some guy. A guy was in the hospital he, because he was an intravenous drug user. His hands were swollen like catches mitts, you know. Um, 
And I remember uh, he's talking to David at one point. He goes, yeah, that's the Apple Scrapple. And I go look at da and David looked at me and said, if you use that, I'll kill you. That's mine, you know. <laughs> but that's the other thing about dialogue. It's not about like a glossary, like, oh, that's a good word to bring back from the jungle. You know, it's, it's, not, it's nothing of that. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, you hear great, we hear the cops will say something great or some non sequitur, or the kids will have a new phrase, but by the time you use it, it's going to be run DMC my Adidas, you know. So it's like, I make up my own. You know, the only thing, you have to be true to the spirit of the person that is speaking, you know, and what they say has to project their personalities. But it's not about slang, it's not about any particular argo. You know, uh, it's not like, you know, I'm out there like Margaret Mead with a big pith helmet on and big khaki shorts and a clipboard, you know, say that again, young man, you know, it's like, you know, you just, you, you pick up the, you, you know, you just pick up a rhythm and an attitude and, you know, people say the darndest things, you know, um, but basically you go home and you make it up. I mean, there was a funny thing is I called, one of my books was called Clockers, the one Spike Lee did. And I sort of made up that expression for like drug dealers, because these guys are addicted to being on the street 24 hours around the clock to make money. Call them clockers. And nobody's ever heard clockers before. And the cops are going, what the hell is a clocker? And the kids are going, what's a clocker? Six months later, they were all calling themselves clockers. <laughs> and not one of them had read the book. Six months after that, the Oxford English Dictionary wrote me a letter saying, we're inserting clockers in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, would you agree that this is the definition? <laughs> yeah, it sounds good to me. You know? <laughs> okay, um, no Samuel Johnson here. <laughs> so, I'll tell you one thing about the Lower East Side that I, I, I did had this, I, I had this one. I witnessed something which is the essential nature of the Lower East Side. Maybe this is the last thing I'd say about this world I'm trying to write about. There was a car accident. An Orthodox Jewish guy holding two watermelons was, cro was crossed against the light and got clipped by a van driven by an Indian and an Italian. And they were kind of had a lot of liquid lunch. When I got there, there was a massive crowd scene. It was on Essex Street. And here's what's happening. You got six cops, all Chinese, in uniform. Because the neighborhood is a lot of Chinese, young, young Chinese cops. So they're all in uniform, and they're putting crime scene tape all over the place. You got this Indian and this Italian guy doing a breath mint thing as fast as they can. You got the uh, anti-crime cops, the plainclothes cops. They're all Irish and Italian, wearing you know s s sweatshirts and sneakers, and you know the badge on the chain. You got two ambulances coming to get this guy. One because he's Orthodox Jewish. The Hatsola Ambulance Service, which is an Orthodox-run medical service, they have their own ambulances. So you got that, and then you got the secular ambulance coming from Cabrini, and it's a race, and the Hatsola ambulance gets there first. So, you know, the, the, these medics come out, and they're wearing yarmulkes, and you know they have they have their uh, you know uh, EMT belt on with all their stuff, and you know, but they have the prayer shawls are dangling down beneath them, and then you got these two Puerto Rican uh, medics from Cabrini that got beat to this guy, and they're standing there with twirling their stethoscopes. They don't particularly like these guys. And then you got the crowd, and the crowd is Puerto Rican, Dominican, Asian. You got one junkie who's sitting on a beach chair, nodding out. He took out a beach chair like, we, like it was the 4th of July. Um, so you got Chinese cops, you got Irish playing clothes. You got an Italian bad guy, you got an Indian bad guy, you're an Orthodox Jewish victim. You have weeping Puerto Rican women, weeping Dominican women. You've got about eight white kids, you know, in their 20s, all on expensive bicycles and all having, you know, tattoos coming up from the base of their spine. What's going on? You know, and in all of this, you know, and you start smelling something burning and it's the junkie and it's cigarette, it sort of caught his thigh hairs on fire and, you know, and, in, in the midst of all of this, it's about 11 in the morning, some old Irish lady comes out, and she's holding a Budweiser, and she's looking at everybody, and she goes, I hate those bastards, and I had no idea who she was referring to. <laughs> so, that's the Lower East Side. So. Google that. <laughs> So 
So endeth, or I can go on. I'm, I'm, I, I just, I don't know, I just did that naturally, but. <laughs> yeah. Writing poetry? No, I, I never wrote poetry. I mean, it, I wrote stuff that looked like poetry when I was in college. Everybody did. It was like the hippie days. You know, it's like the, 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 the most important person in my life for my confidence, and you might not have heard of him, I don't know, it's been a while, it was this guy Richard Brodigan. And the thing I liked about Richard Brodigan was that if this can get published, I'm good, you know. Um, but, you know, I was very influenced by, you know, Ginsburg and the Beats, you know, all these guys. It was very cool to be, you know, free association, freelance. I didn't get it. I just did it. I mean, I didn't understand what I was doing. But if you're glib and, you know, you have a way with words, you can make it sound like you know what you're doing. But, it, it, you know, it's all dressed up and no place to go in my case. I don't have a thing to say about poetry that would be helpful. <laughs> Except if you want to be a poet, you better learn how to balance plates on a tray because you're going to need it. Not all at once. Yes. So uh, when I think about the Lower East Side, I think about Cass's Deli. Does, yeah. does that make it into your novel? And yes, yes. It makes about two, if I read two more pages, we would have been at Cass's Deli. Cass's Deli has been handing out finer heart attacks for the last 60 <laughs> years. And um, in World War II, they had a sign. Uh, hanging, which is still hanging, it said, send a salami to your boy in the army, <laughs> you know. But yes, Katz's is, is there. So it's cut off here. Um, is if Katz's Deli is replaced by a skyscraper, which might be likely in the next few years, what do you think that would do well, to the What's going to happen is then you'll buy your stuff from Katz's Deli online. I'm serious. I mean, there's Gus's Pickles. We've been around since... Jacob Reese is there. You know, people are going online to order Gus's pickles. Or there's this place called Jonas Schimmel's. It's a knishery. They make their own knishes, and it's a thousand years old, and they make their own yogurt. And my grandmother used to, when she was a kid, used to go in and get knishes to, you know, a hundred years ago to like bring home, you know, to her parents. And uh, on, on my, you can now online order knishes, JonasSchimmel.com, but. But I, my, the, my first date with my wife, she's, she was like, Wasp, Massachusetts, and oh, I'm gonna show you the real thing. We're gonna go to Yona Schimmel's. She goes in there, she looks like she went to puke. You know, because they all the conditions like came up in a dumbwaiter. Yeah, you know, and the guy's yelling down there, Murray, two blueberry, you know, and a yogurt. You know, and these things are coming up, to, and it comes out. This thing was so carbonized hard that when she went to cut it, it went, you know, wow, oh, and she's going, oh, this is great. And I heard the tooth crack. And I'm going, no, it's really, isn't that authentic? He said, yeah, yeah, great. But we're still together, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> but I've never taken her back. Well, I guess that's it. You're welcome. <laughs>